Hi, welcome to week eight of the Sunshine Courses on Accounting. My name is Nigel, I'm your presenter. This week, we're going into new territory. Up until now, everything we've been talking about has been focused on accounting principles. You'd be pleased to know that I think we've covered all the principles that we need to cover in order to be able to do accounts, which is an incredible achievement if you've been able to keep up so far with everything that we've been covering. So if so, congratulations. If not, don't be afraid to go back and review, revisit some of the previous uh, presentations. Um, sometimes things that didn't make sense the first time around make a lot more sense once you've heard some of the subsequent information. Uh, there's quite a lot in there, both for starts, beginners, and for people that are quite experienced. Um, but this week, we're finally going to get onto computerized accounting, where things start to get much easier mechanically, albeit a little bit difficult to process mentally. And that's really why we've been through all the principles. Now we can start moving at a much more fun pace. So just to retouch on last week's uh, course, we talked about the balance sheet principles. And the balance sheet principles really is focuses on the accounts, the timing of transactions within the accounts. And remember this really important concept. The period in which you account for profits and losses all flows by reference to the sales you make. The accounting, the correct accounting period that you account for transactions in the profit and loss account relates to the date that you delivered sales, your goods or services. The date you delivered goods or services, that's the date of your accounting transaction. And sometimes the cash flows match the date you deliver. Imagine going to a fish and chip shop you go along, pay your money, take your fish and chips. The sale, the delivery of fish, the delivery of goods is exactly the same as the transfer of cash. That's easy from an accounting point of view. But if you're buying something like an expensive car or a house, maybe the cash flows can last for years with a car. It's often three, four, five years. You might pay with a lease purchase. You might borrow money, but the cash flows are very different from the date that you buy the car. And with a house, it can last up to 10, 20, even 50 years sometimes. So the period that you account for the profit or loss is the period in which the goods or the services are delivered, irrespective of when the cash flows happen. And if the cash flows occur in a different period, we have this great technique of the balance sheet to be able to bring the cash flows so that we can account for the a good delivery of goods and services in the correct period using the balance sheet to carry the differences. And under the matching concept, whatever we sell, we have to account for costs that relate to those sales in that period. So if you are selling fish and chips, if you buy the fish on say the 31st of say January and sell it on the 1st of February, even though you've paid for the fish on in January, the sale is in February, so you need to carry forward that stock through the balance sheet. So it's just to confirm the correct accounting period for accounting for transactions is the date that you deliver goods and services. And under the matching concept, you match the costs that relate to those sales in the same period. And if the cash flows are different, you use your accounting journals and your balance sheet mechanisms to rectify or to move the cash flows into the correct period without betraying your double entry. That's accounting in a nutshell. And last week we dealt with the balance sheet items, the accounting balances, and we use stock and fixed assets as a, as a mechanism, as, a, as an illustration. And we use the balance sheet formats to display just the balance sheet items at the beginning and the end of the period. This we're getting on to computerized accounting. 
it probably goes without saying, the computer does the heavy lifting and the computer is an absolute godsend when it comes to preparing accounts. There's so much additions and journals and uh, uh, formatting of, of, of uh, various statements that's done by the computer for you. It's dramatic time saver. But the downside is it's very difficult sometimes to get an overview of what's going on. And that's why we've spent so long doing a spreadsheet format. Well, as it happens, setting up a computer accounting takes a little bit of time, not a huge amount, but a little bit of time. So sometimes if very simple accounts, it's actually easier to use the spreadsheet format. But generally, computerized accountings are by far and away easier, providing you know the principles of accounting. Because if you don't, it's really easy to make mistakes that you just don't know about. So we're going to have a brief look at the difference between the computer, uh, the spreadsheet and the computer accounting. And then we're going to look at a set of computerized accounts and we're going to see the financial accounts themselves, how they're prepared. We're going to look at journals, we're going to look at the trial balance, and we're going to look at something called the general ledger. And the general ledger is another of these really invaluable tools for helping you pick up if you've made errors and how to correct them. So we'll get onto that in due course. And throughout the whole of these illustrations, we're going to be using these very simple transactions. We've seen them before in previous weeks. So this is some extracts from a cash book. Um, it's got about five or six transactions, but whether you've got five or six or 500 or 600 entries, the principles are exactly the same. So the reason we're using small numbers of transactions is so that you can see in your head what's going on. But of course, once you get in the flow of things, there'll be many, many more entries, which you simply can't do in your head. And this is where the principles of the spreadsheets and the computerized accountings become invaluable. So I'm now going to switch to the spreadsheets to show you an illustration. Okay, this is the spreadsheet accounting and we're quite familiar with this by now, so I'm not gonna to spend too long on it. And I've pre-filled a lot of the information, but as you can see, we've got the tra basic transactions, which in this case, they're just five or six of them, but it could be very much larger numbers of transactions. And what I've done in this particular case to make it a bit easier for what we're going to happen in the future is I've actually listed beside the entry, the category, the accounting category it relates to. Remember, it's up to us as accountants to choose the categories that we think are best suited to the business. And generally the categories will either be profit and loss account categories, if the cash flows are match the same period in which the cost or revenue happens, or if we're paying for something where we haven't yet used up the cost or the revenue, we can put it to a balance sheet item instead of to a profit and loss account item. But in this case, every all of the items go to the profit and loss account. And I've simply allocated them in the normal way. The minus is a credit in the bank. It reduces the amount of money. A plus is a debit. If you remember, a debtor is an asset. So a debit is an asset and a credit is a, the opposite of an asset. So anything that reduces an asset or creates a liability is a credit. So we credit we've made payments of rent, personnel and travel, and we've received some income of sales. So we've debited the sales and credited the costs. And I've simply allocated them in double entry. So the rent of 2,500 pounds is debited to credited the bank and it's put in the rent column. And notice that I've switched around the brackets at the top. In the bank, I said debit brackets credit, but in the double entry side, I'm doing the opposite because it's the double entry and a negative, in this particular instance is a debit. So I credit bank, debit rent, and so on, until I get my overall totals. And if you remember in the trial balance, I'll put my overall totals in the cash book. So let's just quickly do that now. I'm going to take the debit the bank, and then my sales come from here. 
my purchases come from the total purchases. So I'm posting the total amounts, not the individual amounts. The rent, I debit my rent. I've done the wrong one, apologies. I debit, uh, debit the personnel. The next one, I debit my rent. And then finally, I debit my travel. So I've just taken the totals of the cash book and put them into this entry. And I've got my trial balance where I've got my the, the movements in the month. Nothing's at the beginning of the month, movements in the month. And at the end of the, end of the month, I've got 1,085 in the bank. And I've listed out in my trial balance, various sales and costs. And if I add them all together, look at the bottom, the total is 1,085, profits of 1,085. And that's why I've got bank balance. That's the spreadsheet format. There's nothing new about that. Hopefully that's quite familiar to you. I now want to contrast that with what happens with a computer process. So when we use the spreadsheet, we post the overall totals. And if we look at the trial balance, you can't tell what purchases are without going back to the spreadsheet format itself and look at what the totals are made up of. In this case, we have purchases of, uh, we have personnel or wages of 8,300 pounds. And this 8,300 pounds is made up of staff salaries, admin staff salaries, but also sales staff salaries, two separate amounts of salaries. You can't tell from the trial balance what it is. You have to go back to the trial, to the um, cash book, and there's your audit trail that you can identify the, the uh, component parts. And if you're doing a proper accounting, you would have had an audit trail in the cash book somewhere so you could go back to the original documentation. Remember that a proper accounting system means you can have an individual transaction and you can go forwards to see exactly where it appears in the accounts. In this case, the 3,800 pounds goes in the personnel column. And then the trial balance, the personnel column goes in here. So you can see, you can go forwards from an individual transaction to the account and conversely, you can go backwards from the accounts via the audit trail, via this journal to the individual components. The audit trail allows us to go both forwards and backwards from individual transactions through to the final accounts, back from the final accounts to each of the individual transactions via the totals, because that's the premise of spreadsheet accounting. The computers, have a much better brain power than a spreadsheet. With a computer, instead of entering totals, it actually enters every entry individually. So instead of saying, what's the total of our salaries? I'll enter the total, there are two separate salaries, I'll enter the total, total as one total. With a computer, it goes through one by one and enters it each time it comes across the entry. So if you look at the admin staff, the staff sales salaries, it's entered this transaction without waiting to see what the admin staff was. And the reason this is so valuable, quite apart from it reduces errors, is because in this, we have to wait till the end of any period. It might be a week, a month, a day, a week, a month. We have to wait to enter the batch totals which means we don't have an immediate, uh, inter, uh, real-time computerized accounting system in a way that you can do with computerized accounting. So on the 15th of March, we can enter London properties. We've paid money out of the bank, so it's a credit. If you remember the category of rent, the computer system, as soon as you enter that entry, that bank credit, it immediately debits rent of two and a half thousand pounds. It doesn't wait for anything else. So as soon as you've entered that transaction, rent is already in the accounts. Going back to the spreadsheet, even though we've entered rent, this line of rent on the 15th of March, because we haven't yet entered the totals on the 16th of March, this two and a half thousand doesn't yet appear in our accounts, in our, in our uh, profit and loss account or balance sheet. It only appears in our cash book, and we have to post the cash book to the trial balance before it appears in our accounts. That's not so with a computer. So that's 
the first huge advantage of computerized accounting. So the first entry, it goes through, and because we've entered London properties as rent, the computer said, I'm gonna credit bank, because we told it it was a payment or a credit, and the other side, the double entry is rent of two and a half thousand pounds, it posts it directly. The next entry on the 16th of March is sales, uh, um, sales staff salaries. We pay all of the staff four and a half thousand pounds. And immediately you enter it to the cash book. Straight away, it goes to the double entry of personnel. We credit bank, debit, personnel. Notice the debit and credit signs of the double entry that they are equal and opposite because of the way double entry works. But now when we come to sales, on the 16th of March, we got four court sales of £11,210. We debit bank, which means we have to credit sales of the same amount. So I've added these amounts up just simply so we can see they equal £1,085. But actually in computer terms, this is actually irrelevant. What's relevant is each of the individual entries. So what does this look like in the computer's memory? So what I'm trying to represent here, this is a separate spreadsheet. I've used the same cash book entries here. I want to illustrate how the computer enters its transactions. The way the computer does it is this. Each of these boxes is a separate slot in computer memory. And we actually call each one of these an account. So the first payment of 15,000 pounds I'm going to post straight to the bank. I've straight away I posted my credit and I've got my cumulative balance of minus two and a half thousand pounds. That's simply the way I've set this up. That's the way computers work. I now have to show the debit. So the computer says, I've posted my credit. What's my debit? I've posted the category of rent and we'll show you how that appears, how you instruct a computer that the other side of the entry is rent of two. De this time is debit two and a half thousand pounds. So I'm going to copy over to my rent account the basic entries of the amount, the audit trail, and the London properties. This time I'm going to put plus debit plus 2,500 pounds in the rent account. My computer has simply entered both sides, one to the bank account, one to the rent account. Note, you can't tell from this from any one bank, from any one account, you can't see the double entry. You have to go back to the audit trail to see that the other side of this entry of two and a half thousand pounds goes to rent. Or if you're in the rent account, you have to go back to the audit trail to show the other side of this two and a half thousand pounds is the bank. You can't tell from this individual account. Just wanted to highlight that. So the second entry is staff salary. So let's go ahead and post that. So we credit bank. And we're going to debit the personnel. Um, I've got it as a plus, so I'm, uh, as a plus, I'm going to switch it to a minus. Sorry, I showed it as a credit, I'm going to switch it to a debit. I've now posted both sides of the staff salaries. I've credited bank, debited personnel. Notice it goes to its own account. I've got one account for rent, one account for personnel, one account for bank. And so far, everything balances because I've always entered a debit and a credit at the same time. But looking at these accounts alone, it's difficult to tell that it balances. Well, let's keep that in abeyance, but let's just keep entering the um, rest of the transactions a bit more quickly. Next entry is some travel costs. Um, this time it's credit bank, debit travel. The next one is, we've got some more sales. Um, so we're gonna post the receipts to the bank, this time we're gonna post it to the sales. And again, I've got to switch the debit to the credit because of the way I'm entering this through the, through the spreadsheet. I'm now gonna enter the purchases of cars. Um, and I'm gonna put the same amount in the purchases account. So I've got my debit bank, a credit bank, debit purchases. I'm now going to go to the final, the um, staff salaries. Again, it goes to the personnel category. So I go to personnel, uh, to, sorry, I'm posting the bank entry first. So I post this in the bank. 
And the other side goes to the personnel. So I go to the personnel account. And I've got to remember because I'm doing this manually to switch the debits and the credits. The computer does this automatically, so you don't have to remember this. This is just because I'm illustrating this using the spreadsheet. But again, the final entry is another lot of sales. So debit bank, credit sales, because that's what the category is. So I credit the sales. Again, I'm just going to switch the debit to the credit because of what we're doing. And I've now replicated exactly what a computer has done. And the computer has entered all of these transactions into individual accounts. So in the bank, the one thing we can tell with the bank is because the cumulative balance is 1,085 pounds. And if you remember, I added these up, I can actually see from here, this is correct. But I can't very easily see from here whether the star salaries are correct. I'd have to go through each one of these categories individually and look it up in my head to check. Okay, so I'm now going to transfer these figures through to the trial balance. If you remember with a spreadsheet format, we entered the one total transaction. Uh, we, we entered the cumulative totals for the month. What I'm going to do in the computer accounts is simply enter the balance at the end of the whatever period I'm looking it at. So with my bank, I'm going to insert my bank balance of 1,085 pounds. That's the cumulative balance at the end of the period. Similarly, I'm going to do the same with my sales. The cumulative sales, uh, I've not added this correctly. The cumulative sales should be uh, 19,500 pounds. where the, it's the first month, the first entry plus the second entry, the cumulative balance 11,000, at the 8,300, got the 19,000 pounds. So I've just inserted this to the um, computer form, the computerized trial balance. I'm then going to enter my purchases, cumulative balance. I'm going to enter my personnel from the computer format, cumulative balance. I'm going to enter my rent, and I'm going to enter my travel costs. And look, the spreadsheet format is exactly the same as the computer format. Well, not surprising, really. I contrived it that way. But that's the way it should work, that if you've got your accounts correct, it actually doesn't matter which format you use, whether you use the spreadsheet format or the computer format to create accounts. You always get the same figures. Occasionally, the spreadsheet format is easier to use it's actually a bit easier to see what's going on with a spreadsheet format. But with a computer format, it's much quicker. And if you've got larger numbers of transactions, the computer format is often a lot quicker to do. Okay. So, we've now looked at the difference between the spreadsheets and the computer. And we spent quite a long time looking at the spreadsheets. I now want to spend the rest of this uh, uh, session showing you how we put these transactions through in a computerized account. And in particular, I want to go through a few reports to help you reconcile in your mind the principles we've been talking about up till now with what you see in the computerized accounts. And I hope that a lot of the principles we've been talking about will all of a sudden start to make sense. So again, I've got to switch to the computerized accounts. Okay. So I'm going to show you two separate computerized accounts. One is called Capium, that's C-A-P-I-U-M, capium.com. And the other one is Bokio, B-O-K-I-O, bokio.co.uk. Now, I think both of them are free. KPM has been free. They've just started charging accountants. And I'm not quite sure what the status is if you go and register them with them as a non-accountant. It won't take you long to find out. I'm still going to show this to you 
because it's useful to see how different accounting systems do the same thing. The Bokio system is free and it's much easier to use, but it's a little bit more limited in scope. So what I'm gonna suggest is if you register either with KPM or Bokio, you can do various exercises, you can play with it yourself. And the reason I chose these was specifically because they're free and easily accessible. Um, but it really doesn't matter. And if you've already got an accounting system that you use, you don't need to use these two. You can use any system you want. The principles are all the same. So the one I'm showing you at the moment is KPM. And I've, uh, KPM has got a few neat features. One of them is something it calls the quick entry. Um, both of these systems, by the way, are online systems. So you'll find that the responsiveness is, depends on the speed of your internet. And I've got a slightly slow internet, so things take slightly longer um, uh, to process. But I've already entered the journals that we just showed in the spreadsheet. So do you remember we had London properties for two and a half thousand pounds, staff sales of four and a half thousand pounds. So I've entered these transactions already. So I'm gonna look at that in just a minute. I just want to illustrate um, how this quick entry system works because this is very typical of a, a simple journal entry to an accounting system. Remember, in an accounting system, we don't wait till the end of the month and enter everything in a bulk total. We enter every transaction one by one. And in this particular uh, system, uh, or KPM, I can enter a reference. And when I, I tend to enter the reference, the audit trail back to the originating document of whenever I'm showing this transaction. So in this particular case, I might talk about, um, February transactions, because well, I'll explain why in a little bit later. And without um, uh, going to too much detail, um, these fields I can explain another time. But if I want to enter a receipt of money, let's say I um, had the forecourt sales on, on the 16th of March of, I think, let's say 11,000 pounds. Let's say that I've got an audit trail of, um, all the receipts for the sales, which I batch together, and I give it a reference, 210302.2, for example, that's just the internal reference I've given it. That's a reference to my filing system where I can find these things. If I look at the uh, which account category it relates to, it's sales. So with most accounting systems, I'm going to delete that again, you can put the accounting category by typing the first few letters of what you want to type. And when I type SA, I can have sales, salaries, property maintenance disallowable. I don't even know where the SA comes in in, that, or in administrative expenses. But if I type in the L of sales, it's now limited to just uh, any entries that got SAL. As soon as I put the E in, it's just limiting it to sales, sales or profit or not on sale. In this case, it's a sale, a category of a sale, my description is four court sales. My invoice date is the, um, I think it was the 16th of, of February. Sorry, 16th of February. And it would say 11,120 pounds. Um, we'll talk about V another time. In this case, I'm gonna say there's no VAT on it. So the total amount is the same as the net amount. And the one side goes to sales, the other side goes to my bank account. If I had more than one bank account, I could actually select from the different bank accounts I've got. And as soon as I enter this transaction, as soon as I save it, that entry has now already been entered in the, in the accounts. I don't have to wait for anything else or immediately this is now in my profit and loss account. And if, for example, I also wanted to add a purchase relating to that, I could simply add a row, treat this as a payment. I've got a different reference, it's number three instead of number two. Let me call this purchases. 
Um, if you remember, this was Ford. I might say I purchased um, seven cars, six cars. Um, if I wanted to know that, I can really type whatever I want to in here. Again, I'm going to say I purchased on the same date. Um, cost me eight thousand pounds, and it goes to the bank account. And as soon as I save this, this is now already entered to my profit and loss account, or well, to my accounts generally. I'm going to delete these two because all I really want to do is to show you um, how easy it is to enter. Um, a transaction using this quick entry. So I'm actually going to delete the whole of this because I don't really want it here. But what I've already entered is something I've called week eight journals. And if I click on it, it lists out what I've entered as the journals. And these are simply the entries that we put through from the cash book. But instead of entering them as a batch, I enter them one at a time. On the 15th of February, I entered the first transaction. On the next day, I entered the next three transactions. I didn't have to wait. I just entered them straight away. And on the following day, I entered the fo following transactions. So on the 17th of February, I can already get accounts. I don't have to wait to the end of February to batch them together, to post them as one block. So I've already entered these in the journals, in the quick entry in KPM. And now you're gonna see why computer accounting becomes so wonderful. I'm going to show you the profit and loss account. There's an, uh, a, a, an option here for quick reports. I show you the profit and loss account. And immediately with that one entry, I've got a formatted profit and loss account showing I've got sales of £19,510. I've got purchases of £7,500. Wages, if you remember, there were two items in wages. Rent travel cost, total cost of £10,000. It's beautifully formatted. So my total cost of £10,000, my gross profits, which were the difference between my sales and my cost of sales, the purchase of the cars, were £12,000. Cost of £10,000, I made profits of £1,000. And it's instantly available for me. And I haven't had to do anything. I love it. What about the balance sheet? Quick report, look at the balance sheet. Ah, oh, wonderful. The balance sheet shows bank account of £1,000, retained profits of £1,000, my total net assets equals my owner's equity. Remember, this is used the conventional format of switching owner's equity from being a credit or a minus to a plus in the report because it's easier for non-accountants to understand it. It makes much more sense to show total net assets of £1,000 represent owner's equity of the same amount. That's the balance sheet. And I want to show you the trial balance, the trial balance. The trial balance now might start to look quite familiar, is the same trial balance that we just created through our spreadsheet format. And although it's got in a slightly different order, it's listed the bank account of 1,085 pounds and each of the other profit and loss accounts and look, it's that totaled them for us. The total debit equals our total credits. Now, it's very rare in computer for the balance sheet not to balance because the computers automatically enter transactions for you. And if occasionally you forget to enter the other side of a double entry, the computer often has an account called unreconciled item. So it's worth checking through your accounts for unreconciled items where you've not entered the category or the double entry, the computer's gonna enter it, a double entry for you regardless, but if you don't tell it where to enter it to, it'll just make up somewhere and put it some miscellaneous place for you to fix later. But my trial balance has now come really easily just from each of the individual transactions. So although I've got a quick report sections up here, very typical on computer accounting is you'll have a second called reports. And in your reports, somewhere you're gonna have your profit and loss accounts, you're gonna have your balance sheet, and you're gonna have your trial balance. But I want to show you something that's now quite exciting with the computerized accounts, which is not nearly as easy in a spreadsheet accounts. What happens if I want to see what my wages and salaries are made up of? 
I can simply click on it. And it lists out both entries of my sales staff and my admin staff back with the reference to the original entry, the quick entry. And if I click on the reference number, QE1, that's the reference number of the entry, it takes me back to the entry we just did. I can track down my salaries. And if I have entered it properly, my reference here gives me the audit trail back to the individual documents where I created this figure in the first place. So using my computerized system, I've got this wonderful trail that I can go straight from my trial balance back to the individual transactions. And if I make a mistake, let me go back to here. It's really easy for me to edit this journal. I just click the edit button and I can go and change a number here. Let me say it's 2,800 instead of 3,800. Save it. So my profit should have gone up by a thousand pounds because my costs have gone, gone down by a thousand pounds. Notice the account sum has gone back to 2,800 instead of 3,800. And if I look at my profit and loss account, if I look at my trial balance, that 8,300 has become 7,300. Notice my bank account's gone up by a thousand pounds from 1,000 to 2,000 pounds. And if I look at my profit and loss account, I've now got an extra thousand pounds of profits because my wages and salaries have dropped. And on my balance sheet, my bank balance has gone up by two to 2,000 pounds and my earnings equity, my retained profits is back to 2,800 pounds, 2,085 pounds. Wonderful, computers are so quick. This is why computerized accounting are wonderful, but I don't know if you can see this is why it's difficult for you to understand, it can be difficult to understand accounting principles because just looking at this trial balance, you might not figure how you move items from purchases to stocks if you don't have the underlying understanding of why you might want to switch it. If you don't understand the underlying principles, you might not know why that sales may be incorrect because the cash flows of sales may not occur in the same period as the delivery of goods or services. And if they haven't, you need to shift whatever of the cash flows relate to a different accounting period out of this accounting period into a different accounting period using a journal and using the technique of the balance sheet. So the reason it was really helpful to go through the principles using a spreadsheet format is it's quite difficult to get an overview from computerized accountings of what's going on. But now that you know the principles, hopefully it'll be much more straightforward from you, for you to be able to correct figures. There's one final report I want to show to you, which I find invaluable. And it's called the nominal ledger. Sometimes it's called a nominal ledger, and sometimes it's called a general ledger. Now on the face of it, the general ledger lists out each of the individual entries in the same way that a trial balance does. The difference is with the trial balance, it lists the total, the balances of, of this item. If you want to get the, uh, look at what the individual entries are for that make up the balance, in a trial balance, you have to click to each balance one by one, but in a general ledger, it lists all of the entries all together. So although in this particular report, it's got this plus and minus where you can um, increase and decrease, you can hide or show the individual entries, generally with a nominal ledger or a general ledger, it's just two words for the same thing. If you export it as a PDF, for example, exported as PDF. If I were to do that, it would produce a really pretty report showing all of my accounts, the sales, purchases, wages, showing the balance, but also all the individual transactions. And the reason that's such a useful report 
is if you're looking through the accounts and you want to understand if something's gone wrong, or you want to try and get a bit of an overview where the double entry is to something that's been entered, remember, it's really difficult to find it by looking at an individual account where the other side of the sales is. Is it cash? Is it debtors? Um, is it a journal? What's the other side? You have to do quite a bit of hunting. If you use a nominal ledger, it gives you a, an easier access to look at all the transactions you've entered in a particular period, say a week or a month. And I find sometimes that's the easiest place to get an overview of what's going on. And it's particularly useful to pick up errors. By errors, let me rephrase that. Let me talk about accounting adjustments that are needed. If, for example, you've validly, you've correctly recorded purchases in an accounting period, but you've decided the purchases that you've, for this period, relate to sales in a different accounting period, you'll put an adjustment to correct it. Technically, that's not an error. It's just an accounting adjustment because you've accounted for it correctly, but we're going to match our costs with our sales and put through a journal to, to uh, adjust the accounting periods, to match the accounting periods. So uh, a general ledger or a nominal ledger is a really great point to get to see an overview of everything. Okay. So we've now covered uh, oh, I wanted to show you just before I go another accounting system. This one, I'm going to show you Bocchio. And Bocchio works in a very similar way. It just looks slightly different in the way it's got its terminology and where you find things. So with Bocchio, you've got an entry called accounting. And in accounting, there's three sub entries. One of them is a journal. And I've already entered all the transactions as I did beforehand in the, uh, from the, the example. So with four court sales, for example, if I click on this, I've entered it as a single entry, single journal, debit bank, credit sales. And similarly, if remember the staff salaries of four and a half thousand pounds, I credited bank, debited wages. And if I wanted to enter a new journal, I simply click on called, and then it gives me the option of, do I want to record a, a payment out, money out, money in, or non-money? Non-money relates to a journal which doesn't necessarily reflect cash coming in or out. So for example, if you're moving purchases into stock, you would use a non-money. But if I click on money out, it then says, what type of things did I pay for? Let's say I pay for travel costs. So as soon as I put travel, it's already offering me various different types of travel things it might relate to. So, yep, I want travel costs. And here I can enter, I've entered 235 pounds. I can put the payment date. I can put the uh, bank account it relates to. Um, so if I had a different bank account, I could choose it. I can type here, I can leave it as traveling costs, but I could, for example, put it SO petrol. And in my comments, I could put a reference back to the audit trail. And if that's valid, I'll click next. In Bocchio, it then gives me the option to check it or not. I might want to correct it. And then it gives me a button saying record. And when I record it, it then posts it to the accounts. So that's what I did with all of these accounting journals. Let me go back to the accounting journals. Um, I've listed each of the journals. And now if I go to the report section, report section is just a bit higher. And again, it's got my profit and loss report. So I click on my profit and loss report. And again, it's done exactly the same as beforehand. I don't think this is such a pretty format, but it's given my sales, my direct expenses, my cost of sales, given my overheads in total. And if I want to see what the detail is, I simply click on the arrow to split it out between wages, rent, and salaries. And again, I've got my, back to my profit of 1,085 pounds. It's exactly the same because the computer systems are the same. The only thing that's different is the way in which you enter transaction and the words they use and the formats or layouts. And similarly, if I wanted to see how my employee and wages of 8,300 made up, I just click on the button and it lists them out for me. Again, I can go back to the individual journal if I wanted to um, look at what it was, see the audit trail to the in particular entry, or I wanted to change anything. 
and it's got the profit and loss account. Similarly, the balance sheet, same thing. It's got my bank of 1,085 pounds, showing my shareholders equity of 1,085 pounds. Again, it uses the conventional balance sheet format. And it's also got this um, uh, uh, option for an, uh, a general ledger. And the general ledger here, again, is a combination of the trial balance and also the general ledger, because it lists my balances, but I can just click on the arrow to get my details going down in exactly the same way as the previous system. It's just that in this system, it actually lists the closing balances in the same page that you can have your uh, the breakdown of it. So this both combines your trial balance and your general ledger in one hit. And if you click on these double, the, the triple dots, you can actually download or export this to an Excel spreadsheet. And if you do so, it'll actually list the individual entries, I think, um, the individual entries um, in the report. So we've now looked at two computerized accounting systems, KPM and Bocchio. There's hundreds of accounting systems that are available. Some of them are online systems. Some of them you just run on your local computer. The two I've shown you are both online systems. Um, the choice is yours. Different accounting systems have different functionality. But what I wanted to show you is how you use the computer to enter accounting transactions and to create reports in a way that's so much quicker and easier than if you do it using spreadsheet accounting. What you lose is the ability to get this overview that it makes it much more difficult to see the accounting principles. But now that you understand the accounting principles, if you decide that various sales or purchases or costs need to be moved to a different accounting period, or you have costs from a different accounting period, you need to bring them into this accounting period. You simply go into whichever accounting system creates the journals. Remember to keep an audit trail so that you can identify what you've done, but you can use the journals to enter the transactions in the balance sheet, in the computerized accounting, and you have instant updated accounts. And a very neat feature of most accounting systems is that when you have a report, let me say I'm reporting on the profit and loss account, for example, I can choose which accounting period I want to report in. By usually each one has its own way of doing it. In this case, I just click on the arrow, and one of the options is custom interval. And if, for example, I want to enter just March, can you see it's now, so I put the beginning and end period, and this date that is now reporting has switched just March. It happens it's the same figures because these are all March entries. In, oh, beg your pardon. These are actually February entries. This report is showing March and February and January and December. So in Bocchio, it actually shows us a trend, whereas in KPM, it just showed the one month on its own. So although it's showing the March entries, it's also showing, showing me the comparatives. But I could have changed that by very easy by choosing whichever accounting period I wanted to. So congratulations. You now not only understand accounting principles, you've also got a really easy entry way of entering them to a computerized accounting to get instant accounts. You're now starting to get some great skills. I think you're already in a position to start doing accounting for your own business or for other people and to feel really confident in what you're doing, remembering that you know how to do a bank reconciliation, which is one of the key accounting controls. We talked about various other accounting controls. Um, remember, go back and revisit it and you can translate that to computerized accounting. But already we've started to become pretty hot in producing accounts, which is really good news. So we're getting towards the end of this course. The next week or two, or depending on how long it takes, we're going to look at different balance sheet accounting items because each item has got a little quirk, its own quirks. What I want to do is to give you tips and techniques for how to account for different types of uh, balance sheet items. Remember, balance sheet items are about matching, moving cash flows into the period to which that sale relates. You're matching the cash flows to the period to which the sale relates. That's the period in which your goods or services are delivered. That's the, the key 
the key determined key date for accounting. And each uh, balance sheet item has got its own quirk. So by understanding the individual balance sheet items, each one that you come across, you're going to get more and more confident and advanced in terms of your accounting knowledge. And depending on the, the type of business you have, you can get more and more sophisticated with your accounting. So already, I think you should feel very happy with your progress, because I think if you've understood everything we've covered now, remember, you can always go back and revisit previous stuff if you're feeling a bit uncomfortable. But just from what you know now, I think you could feel really confident going to any business and doing accounting. And over the next two, three, four weeks, we're going to simply increase that awareness and competence to get, to, to get a more and more advanced understanding. So once again, um, thank you very much for... So once again, thank you very much for coming to these uh, sessions. I hope you found them useful and I hope to see you next week. Bye.